of Next Great Step and welcome to our fall office hours. We do this a couple times of year for a couple times of the year for the Next Great Step community to really be able to support students, grads, parents, interested parties, and really being able to address the most pressing questions on your mind about the job search, uh, looking for a job while in college or after graduation, what's happening with the job market. And my goal is to help really provide some insight, some guidance as to how to move forward and be able to answer your questions. Um, as I already just said, if you haven't seen it already, I launched a quick poll. If you would be so kind to fill it out, and uh, just answer the questions, that would be fantastic. And that would enable me to just get a sense of, of where everyone is at. Um, just so everyone knows I am recording. I just wanna make sure it is being recorded, yes. And everyone who's here will get a copy of the recording as well as if people registered or they weren't able to make it or if people have to come and go, I will be absolutely be sharing the recording as well. Um, so let's get started. So it's back to school, back to work. It's the fall. It's a very interesting year. Um, we have, you know, graduates that came out of school in May that are still some looking for work. We have some from 2020. We have those that are in college now trying to figure out how do I get that next internship? How do I get my next job? And really trying to, to plan for the future. So we're gonna talk about all of that. As parents, we are, and I'll speak for myself, I have a son who graduated in the class of 2021, and I have another son who just started as a freshman. So I am in it with you. I am absolutely very sensitive and aware to all the issues that we're all facing collectively together because I'm, I'm living it too. So, um, I, I, I hear you. And then if there's other inter interested parties, welcome. Uh, happy to, happy to you know, have you here with us. So just real briefly, so I am, uh, as I said before, I'm Beth hendler Grun. I am the president and founder of Next Great Step. And our sole focus is to help college students and recent grads achieve career success. And our programs really provide the structure to young adults to enable them to be successful in this journey. Sometimes it's very overwhelming, very intimidating, and we really want to make it as easy for them as possible and really yielding the best possible outcome, which is the job that they deserve. So tonight, my goal is to really talk about some of the hot topics that I know are in a lot of people's minds, but also it's my intent is to really answer your questions. So for the first you know, 15 minutes or so, I'm gonna talk about some topics such as hiring trends. You know, what are the industries and companies that are hiring right now? What are the important things that uh, young adults need to know in terms of in-person interviews, virtual interviews, the career fair. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well as um, how to look for job scams. That's a, that's a popular one. Unfortunately, that happens too often. And also how to have success when you first get into the job. But I'm really here to answer your questions. So if you do have a question, you'll see at the bottom of the page, there's a chat function. If you can just in the chat, just go in there and put in your question. I will do my best to answer it. I've had a few people who've emailed me ahead of time. So I have some questions from some others as well, but put your questions in the chat while I'm talking or if things come up or if there's something uh, that you want to know about, that would be great. And I think everyone's muted, but please make sure if it's not already that your microphone is muted. So we, uh, you can hear what I have to say and, and we can, um, we can, you know, get going. So where, where are we? It's been an interesting year uh, and summer. And I think from a hiring trend perspective, we started out the year where things were definitely a little bit challenging. And then we saw this, you know, great big open up of a lot of companies and a lot of hiring, especially going into the summer. We had lots of candidates who were getting hiring. And now as we take a look at the numbers, July was great. And August is kind of softening and September is, you know, we're not sure because obviously uh, as COVID changed, Changes and evolves, it kind of evolves how the job market goes. Um, some of the other things that we're seeing, I just saw an article in the Washington Post that said that there are 8.4 million people as a whole, not just grads, uh, 8.4 million unemployed, but there are 10 million job openings. So think about that, 8 million unemployed, 10 million job openings. And what we're seeing, it's really in the areas that have the biggest uh, gap 
or where the job openings are outpacing the unemployment are in professional and business services. They're also in the education and healthcare services areas, along with retail, leisure. So things that we see, we see these gaps in the market. And I think it's really important to be aware of that as young adults and candidates are looking for opportunities there to see where the where the openings are, where, where the greatest need is. Um, and some of the industries that are experiencing some of the greatest difficulties are those such as manufacturing, you know, trying to find people, finance, real estate, you know, they're really trying to fill those openings because the demand is, is so great. Um, in particular, the top five industries for growth, according to Fast Company, are logistics. You know, think about the logical things. We need our supply chain to improve. We have lots of cracks in our supply chain right now. So any kind of skill set having to do with logistics, supply chain, um, especially in the area of sales, marketing, customer service, I'll speak for myself. I know that you know, our, there's a lot of struggle in terms of how do we meet customer expectations, or maybe our customer experience is not as what we want it to be. Companies want to improve that. So I think there's lots of opportunities there. I think we need to think about how we consume. I mean, in the technology sector, the way we stream, the way we're using e-commerce that still continues to grow and be a very growing uh, area with lots of opportunities. And again, in healthcare, not only on the front lines, but in pharmaceuticals, in all aspects of delivering healthcare, still a huge growth opportunity, as well as construction and building. We can see it all around us in terms of a lot of the movement across the country, a lot of different types of whether it's homes, commercial areas being built, some are shrinking, but I think there's opportunity there. And I think we're gonna to continue to see opportunities in the retail and the leisure market because people are going to want to you know, enjoy themselves as much as they possibly can. So I think from an aspect of, you know, the, that's the market that we're seeing as a whole. In terms of specific to college students and recent grads, you know, things are changing for them in a few ways in terms of how they interview and how they are getting jobs. Over 97% of employers are using video interviewing. And I think that's a really important aspect because the way people are hired is not the way that it was happening a year or two ago. It's we're using this technology and it's a really key piece of how they are employing. And I think young adults are seeing this more and more. Um, even when it comes to uh, on campus. So the National Association for Colleges and Employers have said that over 64% of colleges are inviting employers to come and recruit on campus, but only 11% of career fairs will be held fully in person. That's a pretty small percentage for what's gonna happen on campus. The truth is a majority, it's going to be a mixture. They're saying about 45% are gonna be both virtual and in person, but I think the virtual career fair, which was introduced really in the last year or so, is not going anywhere. And the ability for young adults to be ready and prepared. We're going to talk about that tonight, about how they can be best prepared, whether it's a career fair on campus, whether it's something that's sponsored after graduation, really being ready to handle virtual career fairs and that whole video interview is going to be a really important piece about how uh, young adults are recruited and how they are prepared and how they really represent themselves as they move into looking for that internship uh, and their job. And speaking of internships, you know, the other trend that we're seeing also reported by NACE, that National Association for Colleges and Employers, they have shared that over 80% of those uh, students who had internships were offered full-time employment for this for the following year. That's a pretty high number. We've always talked about the importance of internships and how it could really just clarify direction. But I think now when an employer kind of gets a taste of what a candidate is like and if they have that opportunity, it's playing an even more important role in helping young adults to get that full-time job after graduation. The other interesting quote that they shared is that about 56% of employers are uh, deciding or scanning resumes by GPA. And I get this question a lot. I, I actually think that's positive news because I feel that it's about 50-50 for as much as a lot of students think that their GPA determines whether they're able to get an interview. I think in, in, in equally 50% of the cases, if not more, there's a lot of opportunity to share about 
the volunteer work that was done or class work that was done or part-time jobs. So I really feel like actually there's an opportunity outside of the GPA that can enable young adults to be able to really compete for jobs. And it's not solely dependent on their GPA. The truth is it's still competitive. Uh, you know, you really have to be ready and, and really be prepared for these opportunities. But the good news is that companies are hiring students for internships. They are hiring recent grads. They just have to be able to get out there and, and really um, and, and put themselves out there to do that. So I'll take a pause for a minute. I just want to take a look in the chat. I saw that there was a question about finance, uh, professional services, which I saw was answered. Any, uh, if you have any specific questions, I want to actually share a, a question that was asked uh, in, in an email uh, to me a few moments ago before we started. Let me just pull this up. So one of the questions was, and this was actually in, uh, talked about in the Wall Street Journal last week. So the question is, I've heard that many companies use automated programs that filter out resumes that don't include specific keywords from the job description. What is a good way of identifying these keywords to include in a resume or cover letter? So we get this question a lot. So it's like, how can I be the tracking system? They call it you know, ATS, the automated tracking system. How can I get my resume past those systems? And I think personally, I think we're asking the wrong question because it's not about, do I have the right keywords? Yes, is, are they looking for words? Yes, they are. The truth is, as a young adult coming out of school, it's very hard to have all the right words because you're not supposed to have all the right words. You're, you just came out of college. You may not have all that expertise. And the article actually was written by a, a writer that I've become friendly with there, Catherine Dill. She wrote about how even the most qualified people who have all of the right skills don't get picked up by these systems, which goes to the point about our philosophy is people hire people, not a tracking system. So I think the focus should be kind of really should be on how can you network with someone? How can you contact or identify a person who's at that company who can actually, you can form a relationship with or have a conversation with that can bring you further into the interviewing process. In terms of overall, you know, your resume and tracking system, I do think it's important if you see an opportunity and you see a job and you want to make sure you're applying and that try to line up with what they're looking for, I think it's important to look at the job description and highlight some of those keywords. And then look at what are the keywords that are on my resume or the candidate's resume? And where do we match up? Um, is there an opportunity to maybe reword some things on your resume that use some of those words that you're not lying, that you actually do it, but maybe it's phrased in that way. But the truth is that I, it's not a numbers game. It's not about having the most perfect aligned resume to match the job requirement. It's, I see an opportunity, I'm interested in it. I'd much rather uh, a student or a grad go to their alumni tool on LinkedIn or through their own school, try to find a candidate of someone that they know that works at that company, reach out to them and say, like you, I also went to the same school and I'm really interested in learning more about what you do. You don't even have to say that you're interested in the job per se, but really making that connection and then ask questions, learn more about what that job does, be able to in return, talk about yourself, share what your core skills are or how your skills might align. And that's where we have seen the most success on really being able to bypass those tracking systems. It's building, you know, again, people hire people and you really need to build relationships um, to do that. Um, okay. I see another, I see a couple of questions that, that came in here. All right. So I have a question here. It says, um, my daughter's summer internship was extended to December. It's a prominent PR firm. How can she bring up how likely it is that she will get the permanent position? All three interns on her team were extended and they do a lot of hiring and promoting. Another great question. So this comes to what are your, can, you know, what are you doing during the internship? And, and part of that role, is, it's one thing that's great to get the job and great to get the internship, but how is a candidate managing um, the expectations and understanding also what's expected of them? So one of the things that I always really encourage 
candidates to do is once you get into an internship, even in your first job, is always to make sure that you're, when you meet with the manager, sometimes people are very busy. You know, sometimes they're just like, let's get started. But I think it's always important to understand what are their expectations and to have a meeting and sit down of, let's talk about how do you measure my success? What is it that you're looking for me to do or you know, to meet your expectations? What would it look like if I went above and beyond? What does it look like in terms of people that you've hired full-time, what you've seen from them? And I think having, first of all, just a meeting to understand expectations, but also then to get feedback. So if your daughter's um, internship was extended, which is fantastic, she's been there now for a couple months. I think now is the time to say, I'd love to have a conversation to understand how am I doing? Am I meeting your expectations? I mean, I mean, there's, it's almost like you're asking for that performance appraisal. And now's the time to do that. So if there's any changes or things that she needs to do to better position herself, she has time as opposed until waiting to the end what, and hopefully they'll offer her you know, a full-time job, but if they didn't, you know, she, she has time to make corrections now. And I'm really a big proponent of proactively uh, not only documenting what you're accomplishing, documenting how you're helping the business along the way, by the way, it works out really nicely when you need to slot in that information to your resume, but even better, it's really helpful when at the end of an experience or even partway through to meet with a manager or cross-functional boss or team to say, let me share with you what I've done so far. Sometimes people are not aware. Sometimes they're so busy in their day-to-day as you know, we as employees or candidates need to remind managers of, let me share with you what I've accomplished and let me share with you what I'd love to do more of, or I had a meeting with someone, I'd love to be more involved there. And I think the more your daughter can be proactive to share what she's accomplished and also be clear in understanding what their expectations are and what it takes to become a full-time candidate, I think that would hopefully be a, a good thing to, to move forward on. Okay. Um, Okay, question. What if you, okay, one of the questions is about um, many companies require to uh, multiple years of experience, even for entry level jobs. Is there a good way to get around that? And when you don't technically have that many years, that's a really, really good question. And I, we, all the time people say, well, how is it possible? How is it possible that a recent grad is going to apply for a job when you just came out of school? How could you possibly have three to five years of schooling? So well, put the hat on of a hiring manager. A hiring manager will put something on a job application because they want the world. They want as much as they possibly can. The chances that someone exists who just came out of school but has three years experience but is willing to do all these, it's just not realistic. And what I like to always tell you know my students and grads to say, well, let's think about what have you done over summers? Because that can really equate to a year. If you've done two to three months of something or two to three months of something else, don't let that stop you. I guess that's my number one thing. These are just wish lists a lot of times when people are putting out job ads. This is they're going to ask for as much as they can get. Of course they'd love a really experienced person but not have to pay them a lot of money. It's not always realistic. Do not let that stop you. I think I think candidates really need to think about what have I done, whether it's even, by the way, just because you might have volunteered at school, you might have taken on leadership roles, you might have done part-time work. All of that together to me is experience. I don't care whether it's paid or not, or whether it's continuous or not. I think all of that, it's a matter of how do you present that? How are you able to talk about the skills that you've learned and how you can take those skills and help that company or that organization be more successful and help them do better because of the talents that you have. And I think that's what you really need to focus on. I wouldn't worry about, you know, how do you get around it? It's I would apply, but when you do that, you need to highlight in your cover letter and your resume or in your conversation, how you have the skill set and why they should seriously consider you because you can meet these requirements. Um, may not be traditional, you know, two to three years of work, but I wouldn't let that stop you. I think too many times, uh, especially for young adults, they're like, oh, I'm not going to apply because they want too much or it's, you know, I don't want to try because I'm afraid. Don't let that stop you. Really don't let that stop you. Okay, that's a great question. Uh, let me kind of go through a couple of other questions here. If, if you're struggling to find alumni from your college, so a couple just real quick tips. First of all, every university 
has a portal. And once you've graduated from there, you can um, usually have access. But my favorite way to access alumni is through LinkedIn. And LinkedIn has a tool, and I'll just tell you how to find every single person. If you're on LinkedIn, you have your own profile. And on your profile is the, is the university that you went to. And if you click on the little icon next to the university that you went to, it will bring you to that university's LinkedIn page. So it's almost like a company page. So uh, I'll just say, for example, my son went to Penn State. So on his profile, it says Penn State and you click on it, it brings you to the Penn State LinkedIn page. And on that page are certain tabs. It'll say jobs, it'll say people, and uh, but it'll say alumni is one of the tabs. And if you click on the alumni tab, it will bring you to a tool where you can filter. You can say, show me alumni from the last, you know, from, uh, 2015 through 2020. Show me people who only studied what I studied. Show me people who are only in the New York City demographic. Show me people who are in jobs in these companies. It's a phenomenal tool. It's free. You don't even have to have any a lot of connections on LinkedIn. All you need to do is go to your school's uh, LinkedIn page. And that's a really easy way to search for the alumni that you have in common or that people that might be in a company or role that you want to look at. And I'm a, I'm a big, uh, big proponent of using it. It's a fantastic tool that really enables a lot of information um, about fellow alumni. And by the way, fellow alumni tend to be really friendly and very willing to talk and give information and make connections. So it's it's definitely a community of people that you should leverage and use as much as possible because they love reminiscing with others like themselves who also went to the same university and want you know want to learn more. So that was um, that was a great great question. Um, let me just see what else we have here. I think that answers them for now. So let me let me jump over to just the other subject about career fairs and virtual career fairs. So as I said before, there's going to be a lot of virtual recruiting in general, whether it's whether you're in college, whether it's after college. Um, it, it's it's just something that this is, you know, where, where we are. So excuse me one second. I just want to grab something. Okay. Um, so let's talk about that. So one of the most important pieces, and I know last year I had students who were just, you know, really overwhelmed with how am I preparing for this virtual career fair? It's not like where you can walk into a gymnasium or walk into an arena and be all dressed up and just show up and shake someone's hand and say, here's my resume. This takes some more planning. You know, I think there's pros and cons. There's ways that this could be, depending on whether how shy or quiet you are, this might be um, a, a, a more favored way, but you have to be prepared. So one of the first things that we find most students do is, <laughs> or the challenge is, they're not, they don't know when it is. So today, tomorrow, tonight, go on your college's website, go to career services and click on when the dates are and block them in your calendar. And by the way, if you graduated, most and majority of schools, you still have access to go back and use career services and attend these career fairs. So don't worry if you just graduated in 2021, 2020, earlier, a lot of schools allow you to come back and use these resources and be a part of it. And now that you don't have to physically be there, that could be a real benefit. So you got to know when the dates are. The other thing is they really want you to register ahead of time. So it's, you can't just show up. There's usually like some kind of registration process in order to get you in the system because they're using a platform that enables real-time live chats and real-time live videos. So they want to have your information as well. So make sure that you're, you're in the system. Um, the other thing that's, you know, really is, is the preparation and the research and how do you make sure that you are ready to go? So you want to prioritize. The list of companies might be hundreds long, but what I tell young adults is just pick five, start with five companies that have jobs that look really appealing to you. And let's focus on those and research and prioritize those. So you're going to pick the five companies. You're going to do some research, a little bit of research. It's not very complicated. I want you to figure out who's the CEO, what's the stock price, what is the company mission, which you can find on the website, and what is 
current news about them. So you could type in ABC company, you know, in the news, go to Google and you can find all this information. It's at your fingertips. And the most important question is having answered, why do you want to work there? What about that company is interesting to you, is interesting to you and be ready for that. The good news about things being virtual is that you could have this all typed up. You could have it written down. You could have it next to you. You could have it on a, on a document and then be able to cut and paste it into a chat or be able to have it accessible if someone starts asking you questions. So that's the good news about you can do this homework ahead of time um, that allows you to have it ready. The other thing that obviously has to be ready to go, you have to have your resume up to date and you have to have LinkedIn ready as well. And LinkedIn needs to be matching to your resume. I, I've had the opportunity to speak with a number of employers recently and they say, you know, it's really frustrating when I look at the resume and then I go to LinkedIn and the two of them don't align. They want all the activities to be lined up so they can easily share with a colleague or someone to share the link of your LinkedIn profile. So if you're not on LinkedIn, you need to make sure that you are, but make sure that all of those you know, documents and tools are ready for you as you're going into those, those conversations. And then there needs to be a basic pitch. And you know what I'm going to do in the comments? I know I have my colleagues, Rachel and Lauren are on. If they're gonna, I'm going to ask them to link. We have a little tip sheet, a resource on how to prepare for virtual career fairs. Um, and in the tip sheet also, we're going to, you have to have an elevator pitch. And in this pitch, it's going to be as simply as, you know, my name is, and I'm completed this degree. Um, I'm interested in a career in this area or this field. And here's one thing I did when I was in school, an internship or part-time job, and I'm looking to leverage my core skills. You know, there are no more than three, whether it be like research, analytics, um, digital marketing, and I'm looking to leverage them into an organization like yours because of your focus in this area. So it's kind of like four to five sentences of having a really clear and concise story about what you're about and why you wanna to talk to them. And again, what's nice is that you can potentially cut that and paste that into a chat when you're talking with someone um, in a virtual way. Um, yeah, thanks for, okay, you got the link that. And then the other thing too, again, this is not only just for virtual career fair, this is for every kind of video interview. No matter what, you need to dress professionally. Even if the person says, don't worry, it's casual. To me, until you have the job, you always wanna be in business attire. Because it's video, you need to make sure you have good lighting, good audio. You need to be in a quiet space, make sure you have good Wi-Fi. You know, silence all distractions and you need to look at the camera. You know, I'm talking to all of you. I have a little camera on the top of my laptop that I'm focusing on, you know, versus looking down at my picture. You know, some of these are the things that you just need to practice as part of that whole video etiquette. And the other thing we also offer is you have to smile. You have to over emote because sometimes things really get, you know, um, drawn down in, in video and they can't see that excitement or emotion. So you've got to just bring your enthusiasm as, as much as possible. So hope that kind of addresses some of the career fair. Oh, and the other most, two most important things, take notes. Pen and paper is absolutely appropriate because you don't want to be typing too much. Um, and you must, must write a thank you note to every single person you meet, every person you talk to, interact with. I can't even tell you, I have friends who have done recruiting at multiple colleges and they'll say, I love certain candidates and they never sent me a thank you note and they're automatically cut because there was no note, no matter how qualified they were. So please always, always, always send a thank you note. Uh, when in doubt, keep it, you know, it could be simple. It was a pleasure meeting you. I enjoyed talking to you about this type of topic, but always, always send a thank you note, no matter what, by the way, in-person, virtual conversation on the phone. That's just like one of the most important, important pieces. Okay. Um, let me jump back to another question that was asked earlier today. Uh, let's see if I addressed it. Okay. Um, so are there any steps that I can take after applying for a position that increase my chances of landing an interview? For example, what are good methods to find a recruiter's contact information? This is a really good question because one of the big obstacles for a lot of students and clients that we work with, they'll say to us, I can't even get an interview. 
I have applied and applied and I think I'm the right fit and it looks like I have all the right skills, but I cannot even get an interview. How do I even get my foot in the door to get the interview for the opportunity? And what we tell them is, again, it goes back to that, you know, core networking of really <laughs> targeting in. We want to try to avoid those job boards because when you're applying online, let me just clarify this, 80% of jobs are found by referral. They are not found by just blindly applying online. You are applying into the black hole. It, it, unless, again, you're background or your experience is so unique, um, or maybe you'll get that first interview, you'll get that higher view, one-way interview. We didn't talk about that. We can talk about that in a moment. Or you get that one-way interview where you just have to record answering a question, then you never hear back. The truth is that you really want to be targeted in identifying somebody, especially I tell recent grads, find someone who graduated school in the last three to five years who has the job that you want to be doing because you know it's a junior level job that they got it probably out of college or it's their first or second job. And you want to understand more about what they're doing. You want to know how did you get this job? But they're also, if they're an alumni, they're going to be friendly and willing to talk to you. It all goes back to who can you talk to to build a relationship and that people are hiring people or people push other people along in the process as opposed to a computer or a system. And that's how you hopefully will get a better chance of getting interviews. The other thing we see is sometimes you'll speak with someone and you'll say, I, it could be in conjunction. If you're gonna look for opportunities online, go to the company website. I don't necessarily think, I know it's hard and it's, it's obviously Indeed, Glassdoor, LinkedIn, all of these sites show that there's all these opportunities. But if you see it, go double check it on the website and make sure that it's being posted there. If you see something on the website, fine, then you know it's probably more legit. And then you, when you talk to the person or the fellow alum who works at the company, you can say as part of the after you've spoken and they understand what you're about saying, I see this opportunity online. Do you know anyone who's in that department? Do you know anyone or that could you could bring my resume to? Do you know who the head hiring manager is for that division? They may or may not, but at least, or usually they have an internal directory that could at least get you to the right place. Um, and your chances of getting to the right place and then ultimately getting an interview are much, much higher than if you just blindly apply. It's kind of this, what I call um, a, like triangulation theory, this theory where you have to come at, come at it from different angles. So you got to talk to somebody, you got to apply directly to the company, you got to see if you know anyone else um, that's within your network. But that's kind of the overall guidance about Getting an interview is, again, you really have to try to connect with somebody directly, and that will increase your chances of getting that, that in-person or video live, live interview. Okay. Um, and you know what else? I'm just, yeah, virtual career fair. And Lauren or Rachel, if you could also link, we have a link about how to do well in the virtual interview. So maybe we can also add that link in the chat box as well. Okay. And let me grab any, feel free to add any other questions. I'll kind of add um, a piece and I'll jump back to some other questions in a minute. So one of the questions we get often is, how do I know if a job is a scam? And unfortunately, especially when, you know, young adults are really hungry to get this job or they're finally excited that somebody responds, you really, really, as a parent, as, as kids, as friends, family, we have to be checking these scams. There's way too many of them. I have had stories where, again, a little bit pre-pandemic, where someone would say, well, we have to see, you have to come to our office. We're going to assess you know, whether you can be in the sales job. They put them on a corner of a street in a, in a city and they say, okay, now you got to go door to door, whether it's like selling cable or some kind of phone services. And that's not, it was not legit, you know, and sometimes we get so excited that maybe this is the real thing or somebody's finally replying. I really want you to make sure that that's why I don't love the job boards because it's very hard to um, differentiate what is real and what's not versus the company itself is another reason for using the company website to just identify what jobs are there. But here's a couple things to look for. If the description is vague and it just doesn't sound right, or it's very, a lot of like buzzwords, but there's not really specificity about what the job is and there's spelling errors, 
that's a, a red flag. If they are offering like a lot of money, whether it's hourly or the salary just seems like too good to be true, um, I would question that. I would also make sure you never, ever give away any, don't give your license. They should never be asking for your license, your social security number, not prior to having an interview or any kind of offer. Um, never ask for your PayPal account, your Venmo. Be very, very careful if they're asking for any kind of money or identifier information that's personal passport number. That is a huge, huge red flag. Um, if you can't find any reviews on Glassdoor, so Glassdoor is good because people do like to write reviews, positive and negative, but if you can't find any reviews about this company or the name seems a little weird, um, that's something to be concerned about as well. Or if you can't find a single executive on LinkedIn who works there, you should be able to find a number of people on LinkedIn. The business itself should have its own uh, business listing, or at least there should be people who work there on LinkedIn or be able to reach out to someone there. That's another uh, way to check check it. And also, if you see that there's a lot of postings available for that particular company, that means there's either really high turnover or something doesn't sound right. You know, the, why is there 20 postings or 30 postings or, but you can't seem to find anyone um, to see, you know, what, what that is. Okay. So that's a little bit on scams. Um, all right. Someone is asking me just to give a a quick overview about what we do or what our services are. So I'll just tell you briefly, but really what I'd love to do is if anyone's interested and maybe uh, Lauren, you can link it as well. If you're interested in learning more about what we do, I'd love to have an individual discovery call with the parents, with kids, kind of both. Um, so I can really understand what your needs are. But basically our focus is we provide services to college students and grads, really ages from 19 to 29. And we do it two ways. We do it through group coaching and private coaching. And what we provide is a simple, structured, step-by-step -step approach that enables young candidates to really to be focused and gain clarity on what is it that they want to pursue, as well as how to go do it in a really successful manner. And we really help them to build a strategy to really understand two questions. One, to know what skills they have that they can bring to an employer. And two, who are they going to bring it to in a really confident way? So not only can they answer the question, you know, tell me about yourself, but they know exactly how to target the right companies and how to leverage their best skills. So we're really excited. We're heading into our, I guess, seventh year of doing this. We have been growing exponentially year over year, and I'm really proud that we have over 90% of our clients land the job they desire. And we are not recruiters and we do not put them into the jobs. It's because we are teaching them how to be successful in getting into those roles. So again, um, Lauren will, or Lauren or Rachel, if you can link, yeah, for a consult for a discovery call, would love to, to talk to you about that. Um, and help answer any of your questions as well. Um, so let me see what other, I did, there was a couple other questions here. Let me see if I can grab it. Um, and please feel free to put in your questions in the chat. So the other question we had here is what are some soft skills that most recruiters or companies are looking for? So great question. Um, you know, Companies <laughs> need all kinds of skills and need all kinds of talents, but what we've been seeing is, look, you know, I, I hate to, I'm going to tell you some of the skills, but I also want as individuals, your skills are who you are and are what you've accomplished. So, you know, I don't want you to lie or fudge it, but I think knowing, you know, a couple of what's out there. So one of the most important skills are being able to communicate effectively, being able to problem solve. Um, now, again, this could be in a very wide range of businesses. This could be anywhere from, you know, finance to the arts to writing. You know, there's lots of different opportunities of how you can relay those skills. But again, communication, problem solving, really being able to do critical thinking, um, analyze, analytics. But what we have found is that it's not so much that you're taking your skill and you're matching it to what most employers want. I think what employers want is, you know, candidates to be really clear and confident about what they have to offer and how their skills can help the company be successful. Too often, and I'll, we, had a, we had a session today where we did mock interviewing and, um, and it was, it's, 
I love it because we get to the end and they're doing such a great job. But one of the comments uh, they were saying, they were pretending through their uh, answer and saying, well, you know, you should really talk to me because this would be a great job for me. And very often, a lot of young candidates say, well, this job would be great for me. But the truth is, that's not what you want to say. You don't want to say, you know, Mr. Employer, please hire me because the job is great for me. You want it to be great for them. You want it to be great about helping them to grow, to develop, to make more money because that you as a candidate have these really great skills. Of course, it would be great for you, but they really want it to be great for them. And I want everyone to keep that in mind about how you add value. And really, that's what that's what makes a company want to hire you. And it's also what differentiates you when you're showing how you are so focused on how an organization and a company can be successful and how you want to solve their problems and help them do better. That's what makes a candidate stand out. And that is what a candidate is looking for, not only in having the right skill set to whatever skill set they're looking for, but how you're really enthusiastic to make it happen for them. Um, and I'll, I'll just share too, I'm, I actually, I'm really excited. I am in the process of writing a book and it's really focused actually towards parents on how do you guide your young adult through this process. And as part of this, I've interviewed many phenomenal high level employers, recruiters um, as part of the book. And that is one of the big things that they say is, you know, how can you help me? And they also want this attitude of willingness, being willing to learn, being curious and, and being excited to, to try something new. You don't have to have all the answers. They really, they really understand that candidates are not always, you know, coming out of college, you don't have to have all the skills, but your willingness and the attitude is, is a really important factor as well. So hope that answers that question. Um, okay. And then another question we have here is how can I make my cover letter stand out when applying for internships? Uh, we get this a lot. So it's kind of interesting. There's this, uh, I don't want to call it, there's like this paralysis around cover letters. I've had students say to me, like, I could, I just can't write the cover letter. I don't know what to do. There's just like a lot of fear around cover letters. So it, here's the feeling with the cover letter. You think of it this way. You, you don't want to be repeating your resume. You want to be able to Again, can you enhance what the resume says, or can you address something that they wouldn't know or see? And in the same token, as I was saying before, as like making it about the company, try not to start your letter with, you know, dear Mr. or Mrs., I am applying to the job of this. Everyone starts that way. What I'd rather you try to do is start off with, I've seen, you know, XYZ company really do something bold in this market. I noticed that in the news the other day, this is something that you just did. Like show right away that you're focused on them. You've read the news, you know what they're about. And then you want to show like, and as a result of what I see you doing, I think my skills of, you know, writing or creativity could really enhance what you're trying to accomplish at your company. As highlighted in my resume, here's, you know, here's something that you should know, or here's, here's kind of a quick highlight of where I was able to add value or where I was able to do something unique. And I think when you start to take the cover letter and it's more of an opportunity to show how you're relating, that you understand what this business is about, and again, how you can relate to helping them, that's what makes it interesting. It doesn't have to be this, you know, overly long. People don't want to read too much. I think, you know, keeping it to no more than three paragraphs. Um, it's something that we do spend a lot of, you know, we spend time on in our, in our sessions on about how to have a concise cover letter. But again, being clear about what your skill, being clear about what is their objective? What are they trying to do? do clear about what your skills are and how they align, how they match up, and then how you can add value to them. And I think that's really like the gist of your cover letter should be about uh, them and what you can do for them. So kind of my same, same mantra as I was, as I was saying before. Um, so I hope that that helps. All right. So I'll cover one last piece that I had in mind and, and if there's any remaining questions and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up soon. So one of the last things that we talk about, and I think uh, kind of came up before about how do I secure you know, permanent employment after an internship, one of the things that we've been seeing is this, this idea of tracking and really uh, not only whether it's an internship or starting on the job, it's, it's making sure that there's this some type of 
way to really look at what you accomplish on a weekly basis. And sometimes we'll hear, well, that seems kind of onerous, or I'm not even sure if I'm doing anything. I just feel like I'm filing papers. But the more that uh, you can track, especially when you're doing a part-time job, or it doesn't matter. You could be working at a restaurant, you could be scooping ice cream, but always thinking about how can you how can you be tracking the impact that you're making on the business? Whether if you were, you know, working at ice cream place, maybe you were thinking, you know what, I rang up 50 customers on an average Saturday night that gen- helped to generate over a thousand dollars in revenue. You didn't create it, you contributed to, or you managed it. It's almost, can you see where you're having that impact on a business? And I think the more that they can, um, any candidate that can think about how you're measuring your results and the impact it has on the business, I think it's really important to track because, you know, what did you learn? What did you observe? What are the people that you've met? Because it all goes back to how do you then fill in your resume when that experience is over? But it also helps to really speak about what you've done in that experience and how you can talk about it, you know, to the next person or for the next job. So just kind of always making sure you're tracking and keeping track of what your, your accomplishments are. Um, and then I think we have one other question here about any advice for phone screening interview. So um, <laughs> it's kind of funny. I, you know, I don't think it's funny, you know, so uh, again, cause you know that I have kids who are in college. So I'm of the age where speaking on the phone was pretty much how you were communicating for many years in the workplace. And that's still a main means, but I know for a lot of young adults, speaking on the phone can be scary because it's not something you might do a lot of things with your phone, but you're not always used to talking on the phone or talking to someone in a professional way. So Preparing for a phone interview is the same way that you're going to prepare for a regular interview. And instead of, you know, being able to look at the camera, you're going to try to smile like in your voice. But I think having that clarity of practicing, of knowing, um, well, we actually have a technique that we talk about as a meeting plan. So I guess it wasn't, it's a phone screening, assuming that you're being in a formal interview, you want to really think of these three A's that I say. The three A's are, when you finish that conversation, what action do you want that person to take? What would you like that person to do? If everything went great, what is it that you want them to do? Would you like them to introduce you to the hiring manager? Probably. Would you maybe want them to introduce you to someone who's in the role now that you can get to talk to and know better? Maybe. Would you like an opportunity to come in and shadow if that was for, you know, so think about what possible things could you ask for? Could you ask them to do or take an action to do at the end of that conversation? And if that's your end game, right? You want to think, what's the end game I want out of this conversation? Then in order for them to do that, what do I need them to believe? And that's the second A, it's called attitudes. What attitude do I want that person to have about me by the time we finish the conversation? And normally the attitude is, you know, what are the main skills or core skills that you have? It could be, I want this person to believe that I am highly analytical, that I know how to do strong research and that I have very good financial acumen. And the way I'm going to prove that to them is I'm going to tell them about the time in my, you know, class project where I had to analyze information and use Excel to look at data. Or maybe I'm going to tell them about a time I had to do financial modeling in another class. So again, I could pull it all from classwork. It doesn't have to be from a job, but be clear about what you want them to know about you. And the last A that you want to think about are answers. What answers do you need to make a better assessment as to whether this job is good for you? Answers meaning what questions do you want to ask to get good answers? These are the questions that should be consultative in nature. It should not be something that you can find by doing a Google search. It should be, you know, tell me about how you measure success at your company. Tell me about the type of uh, requirements or the criteria that you look for in a candidate. What has enabled someone to be successful in the role? Tell me about someone who was not successful. Why was that the case? These are the type of more thoughtful, consultative type questions that only a person at the company could ask. And I think when you have these conversations and having this thought of like, what's my end game and what do I want them to know? And what questions, by the way, you flip it. When you get to the phone screening, you try to, if you can ask your questions first, then convince them of the attitudes you want them to have about yourself. 
and then you ask them to take an action. But you really just want to think through, like, what is it that I want this person to know about me by the end of the conversation? And in a way, you're almost like taking control. You're actually being able to control and decide how this actually all goes. Um, so you really want to, you know, think through that. I hope that helps in terms of a phone screening. But you know, you got to be clear about the value that you can bring, the skills you have, and hopefully it'll align to, to where you want to go next. So I hope that helps. Any other questions? I want to make sure I, I've gotten most of them. Um, I know Lauren and Rachel, you were also getting some questions as well. Or so you can maybe post something if I'm in the chat, if I'm good here. But um, here's where we are. I'll kind of just wrap up with a few things. I hope you found this valuable. You know, my goal is to try to bring this type of opportunity to uh, this type of sharing of information to our community as, as much as possible. If you have not already, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. Actually, I just started on TikTok, um, but I do provide a lot of guidance. And if you're not on our newsletter, get on our newsletter. Um, but if you're interested in learning more about how we help college students and recent grads, we would love to have a discovery call with you, your student, uh, mom, dad, family member to really understand what your needs are and how we can best support you. We run our group coaching. We run groups every month. Um, sometimes we run them multiple times. Our next group coaching will be uh, starting on October 12th. Uh, we just started one last week and our clients love them. What's actually really nice, even more about the group coaching is just this camaraderie, because a lot of times when students are coming out of school or they feel a little overwhelmed, it's nice to come together with others because you're all in the same boat and you really feel like you're not the only one. So it's a nice way to, to feel like you have this uh, community of people. So it's very, very supportive um, as well. So so yeah, I'd love to connect with everyone. Please connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can follow me there. We do a lot of posts and also look for my book, which hopefully will be ready to come out in early of 2022. And uh, the, the current title, we'll see if it sticks, it's called uh, The Next Great Step, What It Takes to Help Your Grad Land the Job. Um, so really excited about that. So look for that coming as well. But it's been a pleasure. I really appreciate the questions and hopefully we'll have the opportunity to speak further. Um, and if there's any questions or anyone has anything directly, feel free to reach me directly. My email is Beth, B-E-T-H at nextgreatstep.com. So again, thanks everyone. I will have the recording out to you, but um, hope everyone has a fantastic evening and uh, talk with you soon.